everybody. Welcome to Hump Day Hangouts episode 409. Today is the 14th of September 2022. And this is the week where you grab your POFU live ticket, uh, especially a VIP ticket if you're thinking about going, because uh, those are going to be taken off and no longer for sale as of Saturday, this coming Saturday. So POFU live, if you haven't uh, checked it out yet, head over to pofulive.com. We've got a great lineup of speakers. Really looking forward to that. It's the 23rd and 24th of September. Uh, I mentioned the VIP ticket. If you do get that, then on the 23rd, we're having a virtual beer tasting with real beer that we will ship to you if you live in the US. Um, and uh, all the attend VIP attendees will be there. Speakers will be there. We'll be there. Uh, great time to kind of unwind, kick back, uh, relax have some fun outside of uh, Shop Talk, and then inevitably it turns into Shop Talk uh, and have a good time there before diving into the presentations the next day on the 24th. Uh, but like I said, tickets for those, uh, for the VIP tickets are going down this weekend so that we have time uh, to ship uh, everything to everybody, make sure it gets there on time. So we can't accept any last minute um, attendees for the VIP. Now on the non-VIP end, uh, we highly encourage people to do that, but we get it. Maybe it's not for you, uh, but you still want to grab your ticket. Make sure don't wait until the last day uh, so we can get you the information. You can join if you have any questions. Uh, we can get them sorted out, but it is pretty straightforward. Uh, the, doing them virtually uh, has actually been really fun, but we were just talking about potentially doing it live and in person next year. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see what that looks like, but this could potentially be the last virtual one or maybe last virtual one for a bit. So um, regardless, we'd love to have you join us. So uh, grab your ticket, pofulive.com, and uh, join us there. So with that out of the way, uh, Chris, I'm glad you're able to join us. Uh, things are getting kind of stormy in Austria, sounds like. Yeah, like it's raining cats and dogs here at the moment, like quite nice weather outside. So I'm happy to be inside and it's not too hot either. So um, yeah, otherwise, it's pretty cool here. Very nice. And internet is still stable and working. So that's good. Yeah, which is the opposite. When Bradley, when you have storms, that tends to uh, shut everything down. Yeah, yeah, and it's usually around this time too. So, but actually, today's only seventy-nine degrees in Virginia. It's really nice, sunny. So, it'd be nice to be outside, but I'm stuck behind this fucking computer all day. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, yeah, you got to get out. Uh, have you been uh, out? Uh, we'll just uh, do some chit chat here for a minute. But have you been out uh, ATVing at all this summer, or not I went so much? For a couple hours on last Saturday just to get away from the computer for a little bit, but I have not done very much at all this year. I've been focusing on the business this year mainly, and um, it's been paying off, but I definitely am due. As soon as uh, I've got the first weekend in October, I'm going on, a, I'm taking off for a few days uh, just so I can get, you know, after Pofu Live and everything to go ride. So I'm looking forward to that. That'll be like the first multi-day trip that I've done this entire year. <laughs> so. Wow. Well, all the way in October to do it, but um, that's all right. And better late than never. Definitely, definitely. Well, you guys have wanted to definitely make sure we covered uh, Po Food Live. Um, and uh, we've got several questions on here today, but was there anything else that uh, we wanted to cover? Um, I just wanted to make sure people get up to speed on Po Food Live. Don't miss out, especially if they want to grab their uh, VIP ticket. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I don't think I have anything else to cover other than you know, Po Food Live is going to be great. I've got some really cool uh, method that I've been working on for months, which is um, a kind of an, a lead gen method that does not require Google business properties. It helps if you have them, but you don't need it. And that's precisely why I started developing that because Google ver business profiles are becoming incredibly difficult to verify now in the United States. And that's where I do all of my work. So, uh, and I've been avoiding expanding my lead gen business for months because of the video verification thing. And it finally reached a point where I was like, okay, it's not going to resolve itself. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, uh, we're not going to all of a sudden start being able to verify profiles again. So I figured I had to figure out some other sort of way to, you know, so I can continue expanding my own business. And that's really what I've been working on for the last couple of months. And I've got, I'm going to be sharing the whole method in uh, at Bofu live next week. And that's the only place you'll be able to, eventually you can get it in the mastermind too. Uh, in January, but until then, the only place to get it is Pofu Live. So I would encourage you guys to come check it out. If you are into lead gen or doing even local client work, this is something that works really well for organic ranking. Um, so I would check it. I would encourage you to come check it out if you can. Definitely, cool guys. Well then, uh, let's get into it. Sounds good. Okay, grab the screen. Me pull that up. Cool. All right. Got so it. Get situated. 
All right. Where do we start? Uh, let me see. I think we're at Magnificent Stranger underneath your comment there. Gotcha. All right. Sweet. The web design agency I work for has a very strong domain, a DR80. They have started doing SEO, but are currently linking out to all client sites on the portfolio page. I think many of these clients, as a result, are ranking well locally without paying for SEO services. What's the best way to deal with this without removing stuff from the portfolio that would be helpful? No follow the links. <laughs> uh, yeah, what's the best way to deal with this without removing stuff from the portfolio that would be helpful? Yeah, I mean, if that's what you, if, if, if what you're asking, which I'm not 100% sure, are you asking like, you don't want the clients to rank so well unless they're paying for SEO services? Is that what you mean? Like, that's what I, that's how I'm interpreting it. Do you guys interpret that a different way by chance? Um, can go either direction. Yeah. It says, I think many of these clients as a result are ranking well locally without paying for SEO services. What's the best way to deal with this without removing stuff? Yeah, so I think- I think I'm interpreting it properly. I think what you're saying is you did an S, uh, website design for some clients, but you also sell SEO services. But because you linked to the sites that you designed for those clients from the your agency site that is very strong, very powerful, has a lot of authority built, then you are kind of pushing authority over to them, which is why they're ranking. But you don't want them to rank unless they're paying for SEO services. So I would say no follow the links. I mean, that's the only thing that you could do. Uh, would be to know well, follow the links. More you can do, right? So like uh, you can optimize a Google business profile. Um, you can optimize for other keywords. You can expand on like other properties and stuff and brand them and stuff. Like you can go endless on like those SEO jobs. I mean, also I was going to say, why why even have a link? Like, can you just say the business name if it's like, hey, we've worked with these people. Like just put the business name. Like why? Well, I think it's the portfolio page. So they use that to show showcase their work. So they're linking to their websites that they've designed yeah. for clients. So uh, for example, if, I see. if you got yeah. how many properties are ranking for the keywords on page one, for example, right? So it's one or two pages maybe, or two results. Maybe you want four or five, maybe the whole first page is just them, right? So like, there's a reason why many people charge a monthly fee for SEO services, because there's a lot of stuff you can actually do. Yeah, not, but I think what he was saying was, what's the, how do you, how do we deal with not? So I think we're spending too much time on this. But my, my yeah. point was that I think what he was saying is that he they they want he wants the the clients to pay for SEO services, and right now they're ranking because of the link that from their portfolio page. That's why I'm saying the only thing I would do is just no follow the links if you want to still link to them. That's the best thing you can do because that stops link equity. Um, no follow the links are still powerful though, so. That might not that might not do it, but you could certainly try that and see. That's the only thing I would suggest doing. Um, the next one: Would there be any benefit to building out many Wikipedia clone sites to build our knowledge graphs to help our web properties? Many Wikipedia clone sites. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, well, there are a couple of people who are doing exactly this in reputation management, and once they're they got a certain traction um, and authority they actually feed exactly in the knowledge graphs. Like it can be very help helpful, can be quite good business, like same as like Bradley's doing with um, um, directory sites. And also people paying for that to get actually listed in those, or like actually leveraging it for your own properties. So you can actually use it. It's, it's the worthwhile thing for many people. Yeah, I'm just not sure what a, what is a mini Wikipedia clone site. I'm not sure I understand what that is. If I could see an example of it, maybe so I could. There's like, for example, you have like wikipedia.org and then you have like people's wiki or like, it's basically like the source code of Wikipedia, like the, like similar to WordPress. So you have like the source, and you create your own kind of like- uh, Just a wiki page. site. Yeah, I mean, I'm familiar with wiki sites, but I didn't, he specifically said mini Wikipedia clone sites. So I'm, I just wasn't sure what- I, I, did, I don't interpret, interpret it that way. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, yeah, guys, the thing is, if you can build what I'd like to what I try to do is build branded profiles, right? Because so brand branded assets, that's where you want to interlink them because that those are adding nodes to the knowledge graph, right? You're helping to do that because that and especially when you interlink it, when, when possible, you, you want to create or make the associations between branded profiles when possible. That's the whole point. You're assisting Google 
with de- building the, or engineering the knowledge graph for the local entity, which is part of the reason why the Google Business website, which is the free website that's part of the Google Business profile, is very powerful. I do sales calls all the time with SEO agency owners um, for my, my link building business. And the vast majority of that local marketing agencies and local SEO agencies are not using the Google business website, which is free. I just don't understand that. And it, maybe they just don't understand the power of it. Uh, but, and, and apparently they don't because I have to reiterate this all the time on sales calls, almost, almost all of them, which is because when we do backlink analysis, uh, initially before a sales call, when somebody schedules a call with me, they get on my calendar app, um, they get redirected to a competition analysis form where they submit the details for one location that they manage. It doesn't matter which one it is. It, it's just for demonstration purposes. They submit the details. And I ask for the three tier zero assets. And I describe what that is. The money site, the Google business website, if available, and the Google map URL. And then once they submit that data, my team generates a competition analysis report. And we analyze the backlink profile of all three of those tiers, uh, tier zero assets. Most of the reports that we generate that we that I review on the sales calls with the with the prospects um, don't have any data. There's no URL for the Google business website. So we that's a big blank graph in the workbook that we create with the competition analysis data because we have pie charts and everything from the data. It's an Excel sheet. Um, but we just plug all the backlink data in and it creates pie charts. So anchor text ratios and things like that. And most of the sales calls I go on, the Google business website is blank. It's a, it's a blank graph and it's because it didn't provide it. And so I end up having to explain this and, and I'm getting back to the point, which is the Google business website acts as like a bridge between the money site. So organic and maps. Does that make sense? It's a bridge between the two. It really does connect the two. And so and it's a Google property. You can get a do follow link from the Google business website through the make appointment button. Right. So you can either set a hard coded appointment URL in the Google business profile settings in the info tab or now through profile manager and SERP, you can you can add an appointment URL or you can just create the Google business website. And then the CTA button that you put at the top of the site, which can be a call button, a get quote button or a, a make appointment button. The get quote button is just a little form. That it that people can fill out, put their information in, and it will. And Google Business will send a notification to the business. I don't like to use that. It's very rare that anybody ever fills those out. At least through all of the uh, profiles that I manage, I've never. It's, it's very rare that anybody ever fills the get quote um, form out on on a Google Business website. In some cases, like in tree service stuff, uh, we do get a lot of calls. Ninety percent of the leads generated are from phone calls, not from form submits. So it makes sense on a lot of tree service sites or locations that I manage for me to use the call button. But if you can also use the make appointment button, which then you can link to whatever page on your site you want. I recommend either the homepage or the specific location landing page if it has a separate landing page instead of the homepage being the main website URL. And so you can push link equity through that because it's it's from a Google property. Do, Do follow link to the money site or to whatever page on the money site that you want to link to. So that's part of it. But then through the content body of the Google business website, which is a a single page website, basically, that can take up to about 2,500 words in content, roughly 2,500 words in content. And I talk about this all the time, but you want to link out with contextual links from within the content body of the Google business website to your other branded profiles using a mix of branded anchors, target anchors, and topic anchors. What is a brand anchor is the brand name or compound anchor, which means brand plus keyword modifier or brand plus location modifier or something like that. Then uh, target anchor is keyword plus location modifier. So that's keyword plus city or city plus keyword or keyword plus near me or one of the many variants of near me. So nearby, close to me, around me, et cetera. And then lastly, there's topic anchors and topic anchors are product or service keywords only without location modifiers. So I'm telling you all of this because Linking out to branded assets from the Google business website is one of the best ways to help Google understand where your entity has a presence because it's a Google asset. And those are no follow links from the content body, contextual links from the the content body area of the Google business website are no follow, but they still get crawled, right? It doesn't push link equity, which is a good thing in my opinion, because we hammer that 
Google business website with links and it flows through the do follow link, which is the appointment link, the appointment button at the top and also Google business posts. Those are also do follow links. So again, we can direct where we want to push uh, concentrated link equity essentially through the Google business website because of the, the content body links, the textual links and the content body are no follow. But Google still crawls that. And so it's a, it's a way to help Google to engineer the knowledge graph for the local entity by linking out to all of your branded assets. It helps Google to make those associations, which is important. So could you do it with wikis? You probably could. Um, I, you know, are they branded wikis though? That's that's the issue that I I don't know because there's not a whole lot of context with this question. Um if they were branded assets, then yeah, I would say absolutely. If they're not branded assets, if they're like supporting assets, but they're not branded, then yeah, it would probably help. But I, I would be cautious about how you do it because you know you don't want to have any footprints. What we, I just talked about expanding your entity footprint, but that's different, right? That whenever you're talking about branded profiles, again, you want to make connections between all of those profiles as much as possible so that Google understands that this is me, this, this is where this is the entity, this is the entity over here and here and here and here. And they're, they're all associated in some way. Uh, but when you're talking about like just supporting assets that wouldn't be branded, but like for link building, for example, traditional link building, you don't want footprints. You want to eliminate or reduce or hide your footprint as much as possible. So again, if you're talking about like using many Wikipedia sites uh, or wiki sites, if that's what that's what you mean, then I would, if they're, if they're branded, then sure, um, interlinked and all of that. If they're not branded, then just, you know, treat them as if they were like private blog network sites in that you want to try to reduce footprint. Does that make sense? So branded footprint is good, right? So branded footprint equals good. <laughs> Non-branded footprint equals bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a simple way to think about it. Next question. Hello, I helped a few small businesses with their SEO and Google ads. Now I'm getting more inquiries to help more businesses that I can handle than I can handle alone. I need help with setting up the agency properly and hiring a team. I'd appreciate any feedback. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a that's a long question or excuse me, that's a question that will require a long answer because there's a lot into setting up an agency and hiring a team and managing and having SOPs, all of the stuff that, you know, uh, it requires this. Look, running an agency is no easy feat, guys. I don't care how many courses out there tell you that you can run a, you know, build a six figure agency in six months. It's very unlikely, um, especially if you don't have any experience at all. If you've already built other businesses, then it's certainly possible. It's, it's certainly possible. There's no question. But if you're new and you're a solopreneur and now you're trying to start your first agency, um, it's, 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 it's a lot of work. It's going to take you a lot of work in, um, trial and error too. Even with guidance guys, you're going to have to trial and error stuff. That's just the nature of business, right? And that's why I said, if you've already done it, if you've, you, if you've built businesses before, then you can certainly build a six figure agency, uh, you know, or five figures a month or whatever in, in, a, in, a, in short order, if you've done it before, but that's because you already have experience, right? Uh, and, and that's, it took me years to get to that point. And now I've been able to duplicate businesses again, much, much quicker. Right. And that's just because of, again, experience and, um, you know, having done it before and also having, you know, infrastructure and all of that kind of stuff. So the, the short answer is it's going to take too long for uh, a hump day hangout. <laughs> for me to give you any kind of guidance other than you need to probably get into like our mastermind, for example, which that's precisely what the mastermind is for. Guys, SEO is great. Everybody, you know, is here because they love SEO. I get it. Um, but I think our industry is is flawed in the fact that there is a ton of products out there that talk about, you know, how to like some sort of hack, SEO hack or whatever some loophole, whatever, or even the foundational principles of SEO. All of that is good. But in our industry, there's a lot of products out there that, that, that teach, like tell people, hey, look, we're going to teach you how to rank stuff. And then you're going to, you're going to, like, you're going to be financially independent because you're going to know how to rank stuff. And that's bullshit. There's a lot of really good SEOs out there that aren't making money. <laughs> they know how to rank stuff, but they're not making money from it, or they're not making enough to support a family and are living. And I'm, I'm just saying that because I, there's a lot that goes into running an SEO business. It's one thing to learn SEO. It's another 
to run a business, right? Uh, and then especially an agency, you can run a, you know, running a solo, as a solopreneur doing SEO, as a freelancer, that is a, um, exponentially easier or a hell of a lot more uh, uh, simple than running an agency where now you've got personnel and you've got, um, you know, overhead and all uh, considerably more overhead and all that other kind of stuff. So I'm saying all of that because if you really want to be successful in SEO and make it a career and actually run an agency from it, then you need all of the support on and, and uh, for building and running and operating, managing a business, right? It's not just learning tactics to rank stuff. That is just the front end of it. And in fact, I've, I've said this many times before, if you really want to make money in SEO, focus on prospecting and sales and find one of the many SEOs that I just mentioned that are incredibly good at ranking stuff, but they can't, they're not making any money because they're no good at prospecting and sales or they don't want to be. They're introverts, that kind of stuff. There's a ton of that in our industry, by the way. People that like to hide behind their computer and, and they're good. They're good at doing SEO, but they're not making money from it because they're not out you know, shaking hands and kissing babies and that kind of stuff, which is what you got to do. If you want to be an agency owner, um, you know, it's going to be likely you doing the prospecting and sales up front. And that's where your money comes in, guys. You make money from selling, not from producing SEO, not from ranking stuff. Yeah, that is the, that is what you're selling. So you have to be able to produce those results. But the rankings is not what makes you money. It's the sales that makes, is the revenue producing activity is selling. So if you want to get good at it, uh, um, make money from being an agency owner, focus on prospecting and sales. Find some of those tacticians that are really good at SEO, but aren't making money because they suck at sales, right? And, and, and do a JV with them or bring them in, bring them on as an employee or as a freelance contractor or whatever, whatever engagement you have. But that's what I would recommend. So, I, I'm, you know, getting back, I'm just saying, if you want to, if you want to make money, I think it's backwards. Most in this industry, most people come in thinking, if I just learn SEO, I'm going to make money. And that's not the truth. There's a lot of struggling. There's a lot of hungry SEOs out there. Does that make sense? Um, it's in, in my opinion, it should be like first learn prospecting and sales because you can, SEOs that can actually get results, they're, they're, all, they're everywhere. I mean, they're, it's not hard to find an SEO that can do, can do it, right? So anyway, I think being in a mastermind group or in a group of peers other people that are trying to do what you want to do or are already doing what you want to do is probably the best way to grow because you can learn from other people's mistakes. You don't have to make all the mistakes yourself. Uh, you'll get guidance from people that are already successful, that are already making the level of income that you want to make, that kind of stuff. So I'm going to, once again, just encourage you to come join the mastermind because that is precisely what it's about. Yes, we teach SEO in the mastermind, but we also teach how to run a business how to operate it, how to manage, how to hire, how to outsource, how to build SOPs. We're talking with my partners about it. It's funny, but we just did a survey over the last two or three weeks um, asking you guys, our, our our audience, what kind of content you want. And I, I, I listed um, like eight different items. Like here's the different topics that I'm willing to produce content on. And um, I, 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 we asked for you guys, our audience, to rank them by priority with one being the most important and you know eight or whatever it was being the least important. And SOP, standard operating procedures, which I put on there because I know how important they are to actually running a real business, uh, was like, I think that was number eight. Was it, Adam? Was it, it was either seven or eight. Anyways, it was way at the yeah, bottom eight. of the list. Yeah, it was, the, it was like the last item, the least uh, popular or um, the least desired item out of the items that I listed and asked for people to rank in priority. And that just blows my mind. You know, it's funny, but I was telling the guys like, you know, okay, fine. I'll start producing more content about what you guys want. But once you start getting the content that you want, I'm going to give you the content that you need. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I say that, I mean that with all sincerity, because, you know, again, learning uh, SEO tactics is great, but running a business and, um, that's a lot more difficult. And the SOPs is how you can scale. Like you can be a solopreneur doing SEO and make ends meet, right? You can, you can make, make some decent money doing that. But if you truly want to scale, you need to create a, a business from it. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean, mean that you have to have an agency with dozens of employees and everything else. Certainly not. I prefer a lean agency over a big one anyways. I really do. 
Um, but you still need processes, right? You still need processes so that you can duplicate yourself. You can have consistency in your output. Just think about that. I, I have a, I have a calls all the time with mastermind members, that new, new mastermind members that come in. And something I hear often is that they're just not confident in their abilities. Yeah, they get results sometimes, but they're not always consistent. So, and so I ask, well, do you have a repeatable process? What are your, what are your standard operating procedures look like? Well, I don't really have those. Well, then that's why you don't really have consistent results or you don't really know like what you did produced results because you do a little bit of this on this property and this plus that on that property. And so you don't, you never really know. You have to have repeatable systems in place, right? And that's what standard operating procedures are for. And um, anyway, I know how important they are. And so I'm always wanting to share and build SOPs for our members and things like that. And the, you know, those that are more advanced that have bigger agencies, they appreciate that. But most of the people that come in, they're not interested really in the SOPs, which just blows my mind, but it is what it is. You know, we got to give you guys what you want first. And then uh, once you trust us, then you get what you need, right? Hopefully that's the way that it works. But so when it comes back to wanting to build an agency, um, you know, I recommend surrounding yourself with people that are already doing what you want to do, right? If you listen to people that tell you how to build an agency that aren't running an agency currently, then they're not really qualified to, to tell you that, uh, you know, to, to give advice. So just keep that in mind. Um, do you guys There's want to comment only on one that? thing that you kind of forgot that I just wanted to say. The reason why people do not like so much the SOPs is because they're not asking themselves the right question. So and same with sales and stuff, right? So like the, the thing is like, what makes the money, right? It's like, how do I make the money, right? And uh, for me, it's like once the money is coming in, and then motivated, like we're just like right now. Initially, it's like yeah, it's always exciting. This latest tech is like all shiny objects, right? But um, I, are you really going to get like the stream of income and like the big bucks from that? Most likely not. And that's like where SOPs come in, right? Because like you can grow, you can scale. Mm -hmm. And you build momentum that way. Whereas like if you just follow a hack, then let the hack close it, the door for that hack closes, you're starting from scratch. And it's like, um, how to say this? It? It's, like, uh, it, it's a different philosophy, right? So it's like you, you're chasing problems on one end, which is like chasing the hacks and stuff. Whereas you're actually creating, right? Creating and that SOPs means you're creating the business kind of thing. Yeah. And that's like a completely different mindset. Yeah, that's like a franchise model. You know, franchises are successful because they have SOPs, they have processes. People are buying into a franchise, which is a business in a box, systems. They're buying systems yep. that are duplicatable, repeatable. They're already proven. That's the whole point with SOPs. And it's just just amazes me that uh, it is what it is, though. I mean, we, we surveyed our audience specifically so we could find out what it is that you guys want. And SOPs was at the very bottom of the list. So... I get it. I'm still going to produce them because I'm building, I build them for my own uh, business all the time. Like literally I, I make jokes about like, you know, there's, I even have an SOP for how, how to blow my nose. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so it's, it's, I, I say that kind of as a joke, but it's, it's true. Um, and like I said, for our agency uh, members in our mastermind, that have bigger agencies that, you know, they appreciate that. So I'm going to continue building that, um, building, building SOPs and they're, they're available in our mastermind. But in the meantime, we'll, we'll just do more of the training that you guys say you want. So, but yeah, I think that's a great question. I think you're, uh, you know, I don't think there's ever been a better time to build a um, local marketing, SEO, a local SEO agency. And I, I truly mean that. I think right now is the best time to do it because it's becoming more complicated yet. We have tools available to us now that make, our job so much easier than it was even five years ago. Yeah, it might have been easier to rank stuff back then, but we it was a lot more work. As far as uh, now, we've got a lot of tools and things like that that you know with AI and it's just I think it's an exciting time. And I, I also I've, I've showed this before, but um, you know what? I'm not going to pull that up right now. But the if you go to Google Trends and you just search uh, like SEO agency, SEO company, local SEO, you'll see it's a it's a steady demand. It, it, the demand is increasing. It's a steady increase in demand or search interest for those types of keywords, which means people looking for SEO companies, SEO agencies, local SEO, that kind of stuff. And so that just goes to show you it is a, a um, 
an industry that is increasing in demand, which is always, if you're going to start a business, always make sure you're going to start a business in a business that either has increasing in demand over time or an increase in demand over time, excuse me, or steady demand historically over time. It's steady. You don't want to enter a business that it has declining demand, right? Because then, you know, a year from now, you're going to have less customers, uh, of a less, uh, less available customers than you do today. And that's certainly not a type of business that I want to be in, right? So I think it's a really good time to be in um, local SEO. I really do. But just surround yourself with other people that are already doing what you want to do. And um, that's what that's what our mastermind is for. And ours isn't the only one, but I'm going to say it's the best, <laughs> obviously. Anyway, that was a good question. Next one. Hi, guys. I was wondering what your go-to link building tactic or package would be for powering up a client location pages every month? Would you suggest doing press releases each time? Uh, no, I mean, press releases are a part of what I do, but they're not the only thing. Um, four or five years ago, when we launched local PR pro, um, I actually like at the, at that time, that's all you wouldn't literally, you could rank with just press releases. Um, you may be able to do that now, but I think it would be very difficult and would take a high volume of press releases. And I don't know that you could rank on press releases alone now. Um, I haven't attempted that in years, to be honest with you, because it is part of an overall strategy. I use press releases as a component of a larger strategy. Um, so I don't think press releases would be the be all end all. I don't think you'd be able to get the desired results from just press releases alone. Okay. Um, don't want to repeat the same thing over and over or potentially over-optimize anchors. And yeah, you got to be worried with that. And I talk about this. I, I can share that here conceptually, guys, but I use press releases. I don't link directly to the money site with press releases. And I have not done that for over a year now. Um, I do it. I always, always, always use Google business website or actually more appropriately, the Google business posts as the target URLs for press releases right? As I talked about at the top of this webinar, the Hump Day Hangout, um, Google Business Post, the CTA button is a do follow link, that call to action button. And so the CTA button, if you pick learn more or book, when you are publishing the post, you can select the CTA button type. And the two that will accept a URL is make appointment or excuse me, um, learn more and book. Okay. And you can put a URL in there. So that's a do follow link. Now, the anchor text of that button so the anchor text of that link is either going to be learn more or book. So that's what you call a generic or a miscellaneous anchor text. Okay. So publish a Google business post that is a summary of whatever it is that you're linking to on your money site, right? So whatever page or post that you're going to link to on the money site that you want to promote, you just summarize that page into a 200 to 225 word Google business post. That's about how much content a Google business post will accept, which is 1500 characters. Yeah roughly 225 words max, okay? So we always aim for 200 to 225 words, uh, which is a summary of the page that it's linking to. Then we select the CTA button, either call, learn more, excuse me, learn more or book. We link to that page or post, whatever, the target URL, okay? And then we, um, obviously we include the keywords in the post, the Google business post text. But then we use press releases to link with an exact match or what I call a target anchor to the Google business post URL, not the share URL, which that little, you know, short URL that Google gives you, but the inner page of the Google business website. So when you publish a Google business post, as long as you have the Google business website published, then eventually it used to be within minutes. Now I've seen it take as long as eight hours. I'm not kidding. For when you publish a Google business post, it will appear as a post on the Google business website. And if you click the Google, the, the post on the Google business website, it will open up as like an inner page of that site, right? That's the URL that you want to use as your link target for a press release. All right. And then what you do is you, again, target anchor. So that's keyword plus location modifier or an exact match keyword is another term for that, that would link directly to the Google business post URL. Now you're hitting that Google business post with you know, 300, 400 links from press releases that all have that exact match keyword, but it's buffered through the Google business post, which is a Google domain. And it's and it, the CTA button is a uh, generic or miscellaneous anchor, learn more or book. So you're not, you don't, you're not in danger of over-optimized anchor text and you're using the Google site to buffer the press releases. 
Does that make sense? It's a very, very powerful strategy. And that's the way that I do it. And then I, I will often have a second link in the press release, which will be to the Google map share URL or to a Google review. So let me just give you an example of that. We'll just use, I use this in some of our demonstrations. It's not my site, but they did a really good job with their website. But anyway, like what I'm talking about is the Google business website. You publish the post, as I mentioned, that becomes the primary target URL of the uh, press release. So I don't link, I don't link direct to the money site at all anymore with press releases. It's always buffered the way that I'm explaining. And it has been for over a year for me. And I've taught about this before. Okay. But so again, um, link to the Google post URL. But if you want to have a second link in the press release, which makes sense, then I link to the map share URL. See this? This is a 302 redirect. But it makes sense to link to that because Google expects people to link to a uh, map through the share URL, not the CID URL or this long, ugly thing up here, right? And so you're not pushing link equity in there, but it still helps to provide a natural looking link profile as well as Google is, and, and why do I say you're not pushing link equity? Because this is a 302 redirect, okay? If you take a look at a 302, or excuse me, a Google um, map share URL, you see there's multiple 302 redirects. That means it does not pass link equity. It's fine. We're not trying to push link equity into the map with the press releases. It's about creating a natural looking link profile. And then also if you're running any sort of traffic, whether it's natural traffic that occur because they land on press releases, get traffic guys, like at least press advantage is what, what do we use? And have I have been for since 2014, um, long, long time I've been using press advantage. Um, if you have, if you do are doing press releases direct to the money site and you go look at analytics, you'll see referral traffic coming from press advantage. Like no question. I, I see it all the time. Or when I used to do press releases direct to the money site, I don't do that anymore. So what I'm saying is press releases will get traffic, but you can also manipulate traffic, right? You can run uh, click-through rate manipulation traffic through any sort of CT or click-through rate manipulation tools, or I call it CT spam. Um, that will allow you to set up referral traffic campaigns. So then you set up the refer as the press release. And then you have the bot, which is what the apps do, right? Go visit or open up the press release, go visit the press release, then find the target URL and click through and then engage on the resulting page a bit, right? Click other internal links and things like that. So click activity on a Google map share URL is what Google is expecting. And it's very powerful because it's an engagement signal. So that's why I'm saying it's not about pushing link equity into the map as it is about creating a natural looking link profile. Think about this, guys. Most people, and let's see, gather up's been broken lately. So let's see if it works. So this is the CID map URL. This is what SEOs like to build links to, right? But that's precisely why we shouldn't build a lot of links to it because it, the only people that even know how to get this URL are SEOs. No, the layman, the civilian, the normal person, bloggers, everything else, they don't, like normal people don't even know what a CID map URL is. So if somebody was that wasn't an SEO was going to link to a map because it was useful to share the map or it was a resource or whatever, they're going to click the share button on the map. Not this. Nobody knows how to get that unless you're an, an SEO. And even SEOs sometimes don't know how to get this. So that's why I'm saying this is not something that you, this is a, this is a straight um, and if it's correct, because this, this is what's called a gather up Chrome extension. It's not always accurate. Let's see if it shows Culpepper Home Services. It does this time, but sometimes that CID map URL is not correct. You have to check that. But what I'm saying is, guys, if you take a look, I'm going to repeat this again. If I, if I paste that CID map URL in there, which is the company ID, that's what CID is, right? That's the company identifier. That is that's it. it. There's some very strategic reasons to use that URL, um, like in schema, for example, because what is schema? Schema is bot is code that is for the bot, for the Google bot, right? So using a CID map URL and schema for like has map designation, that's super powerful because it's got the, the, the map ID, the company ID. Does that make sense? So it, at the code level, it's not a hard link. It's not an actual hyperlink, but it's listed as a has map or and even you could list it in the same as attributes for example in schema or structured data because now it's got a company identifier in there it's for when the bot comes and reads it it reads that cid equals and in the company identifier and it makes that association right so that's important linking to from the google business website uh, with a contextual link using a brand anchor 
is also good because again, that's a Google property. But hammering away at this URL with backlinks is not a smart thing to do because that's a red flag. Nobody does that except for SEOs that are trying to manipulate maps. So that's like an instant way for Google to determine who those that are trying to manipulate search results or maps results in this case, right? So that's why I say we, even in my link building business, we, we track as part of our backlink analysis and our, our um, link reports, we track the links to the CID map URL, but we don't build a lot of links to that. We do map embeds. That's different. That's totally different, right? Um, and then when we do build links to the map URL, we typically do it to the share URL because again, that's the natural way to link to a map. So what I started to show you was if we, if we hit enter on that, you'll see in just a minute, once the map loads, you're going to see that URL unfurl. You saw, you guys probably just witnessed that, right? After the map fully loads, that URL switches to this long, ugly URL, right? And so if, but if we were to go look at this in a redirect tracer, we'll see that this is a 200, a test okay, which means there are no redirects. Even though it does unfurl into this long, ugly URL, it is, we could build links to this if we wanted to push link equity into the map. We could build links to this, which is a horrid link. It's awful. It's long. It's, it's just ugly. Or you could build links directly to that CID URL. And that will allow you to push link equity in the map. But again, that's an unnatural looking link profile because people don't do that unless they're SEOs that are trying to manipulate maps. So you got to be very strategic about how you do that. So getting back to why I was saying building links to the map share URL does not push link equity to the map, but it does provide a natural looking link profile. And then where it is really powerful is if you are getting click activity on this link, because Google expects to see click activity on that, which is an engagement signal for the map. Well, how, what else is a good engagement signal? Well, you could link to reviews. So if we click on reviews for a second, guys, you see how there's a share button here, right? For each one of these reviews, every one of these reviews has a share button, right? So just pick one, right? Let's pick this one. I'm going to copy that URL right there. That's also a great opportunity for linking because why? Because you're building links to a map, um, uh, excuse me, to a share URL, which is natural. It's not going to push link equity to the map, but Google expects to see that. And then also, um, I like to use anchor text that says company name reviews or review of company name, things like that. So that when people do a search, because this is natural human behavior, when people decide on a company that they want to do business with, especially in the like contracting or home services industries, some people will often, before they call to schedule an estimate or decide to accept a proposal that was presented for the work that they requ requested, they, they oftentimes will go to Google and do a search for the company name reviews, right? And so by using... It, with, with press releases, I like to also always target a review or not. It's not always, but in almost every press release, we link to a Google business post, as I just described, and then also to a review. And we vary the anchor text to, that link to the review uh, URL to do company name reviews or five-star review of company name, things like that, so that those will rank when somebody does a search for company name reviews, Right. And so it's a very powerful, and then also, again, once again, click activity, sending click activity through that is a, is another powerful signal. It's an, it's a powerful engagement signal. So take a look. You'll see that is also a 302 redirect. You see that? So it does not push link equity into the map, but still powerful. So uh, the press releases strategy, you know, I still use press releases, very, very important part of what I do, but I use them a lot differently now than I did even two years ago. Um, anyway, there you go. Golden nuggets right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, all it's all location land pages both the client. Yeah. So, you know, the other thing is powering up as far as what type of link building. I mean, topically relevant links. I've been preaching about that this entire year, the whole year of 2022. I've been talking about topically relevant links. And so that's what I recommend. Um, you know, I teach in the mastermind how you can do it yourself. I literally teach everything that I do in my link building business in the mastermind. Everything. I don't have anything. I've, I've shared absolutely every method, every tactic, everything that I do in the mastermind. And that's what I recommend. So if you want to do it in-house or on your own, you can learn about that in the mastermind. Or you can have me do it for you because I sell links. I have a link building business. I do monthly link building services. I do one-off packages. We do PBN links, custom rebuilds, all kinds of stuff. I'm not here to pitch you on that. I'm just saying, if you want to learn how to do it yourself, come join the mastermind. I'll teach you it. 
you know, we've already got the training in the mastermind in various mastermind webinars that shows absolutely everything from competition research or competition analysis to um, uh, backlink analysis to anchor text ratios to um, how to determine which links to build, how to find the appropriate topical categories, like everything that this, the velocity, the speed with which to build links, hosting, how to find domains, all of that is taught in the mastermind. If you don't want to go through all that and you want to just outsource it, which is what I recommend, as I talked about at the beginning of this webinar, um, you know, the best thing that you could do is find good third party vendors or prov third party providers or vendors that can um, that you can use for white labeling that are good at what they do so that you can focus on prospecting and sales. Right. So you can sell more SEO services and you have providers that can fulfill for you. That still, but fulfill at a reasonable rate so that you have enough markup that you're making money without having to do the work, right? But if you want to do it in house, by all means, do it in house. Then you have to learn the processes and the methods, which again, that goes back to SOPs, which I talked about at the top of the webinar. Uh, if you want to do that kind of stuff in house, which is cost effective, there's management involved, which can be a nightmare and it's on its own. But um, then you have to have processes in place and everything documented so that you can hire new people and they're going to be able to cons pr produce con uh, consistent output like what you have been doing, right? That's what SOPs are for. So um, yeah, I mean, topically relevant links, that's press releases should be a strategy in my opinion. Branded entity assets, as we've been teaching for years, um, what was, uh, you know, we, we had dubbed it the SEO shield. I'm not going to call it that now because that's former partner and his um, partner now, at, at, you know, that's kind of their branding of it, but branded entity assets, period, right? All of that is part of it and empowering those up. Cloud pages, cloud stacks. I do cloud pages, not really cloud stacks, but cloud pages, those all help. There's just a number of things that can be done. All right, next one. Um, <clears throat> is it now advisable to only build a branded tier one network and build backlinks to the properties as opposed to a three-tiered approach using a branded ring and two persona rings? I'm not sure if Google updates flagged the three-tier approach. Thanks, Vito. Um, Vito, yeah, I mean, I've for years I've been teaching that I I don't like to, I know I did not like to use the three-tiered approach or the it, it, it was actually a, a two-tiered network, right? There was the primary network and then there was a second tier that had three networks. The way that we developed, the way that I developed it years ago was a uh, a two-tiered network had four syndication rings. There was the primary branded ring with three persona rings that each of the three persona rings were triggered off of Blogger, Tumblr, and WordPress respectively, right? So syndication ring number one or persona ring number one was triggered off Blogger. Uh, persona ring number two was tr triggered off Tumblr. Persona ring number three was triggered off uh, WordPress.com. But the branded ring was triggered off of YouTube and or the money site RSS feed, right? And that's, that's called a two-tiered network. And I've been teaching for years that I did not prefer or even recommend a two-tiered network for money site syndication, for money site content syndication. You can do it, but it was a pain in the ass because at tier two, you should have also included other RSS feeds besides just the money site feed. Or at, at tier two, it was the blogger, Tumblr, or WordPress.com feed, but it was exclusively content that originated from the money site, and if that makes sense. So in other words, if you're using a two-tiered network, the, the persona rings, which is tier two, they would be, uh, th they should have other content in the same topical categories published on those blogs, but from other sources. Otherwise, it's a clear footprint that was being used for manipulating search results, right? It's fine to do two-tiered networks on in as many tiers as you want on for YouTube syndication. Google doesn't care about YouTube syndication. In fact, you're acting as a publisher for Google. So that's why we never, ever experienced any sort of negative effect from stacking uh, multiple tier one syndication networks to the same channel or multiple tier two networks, or in some cases, and some of our former members have actually done like multi-tiered networks, like seriously out six, eight, 10 tiers. That's a management nightmare. I mean, God bless them for building all that and maintaining it. But if something breaks down in a complicated network like that, it takes forever to troubleshoot where the breakdown is because there's so many moving like pieces. Um, this is why I didn't like it. I like simplicity as much as possible, right? So, but with YouTube, it never mattered. Like you could stack as many tier one networks on the same channel as you wanted or as many tier two networks or even add additional tiers if you wanted. 
And that was never an issue. But with money sites, you, if you were only tar using the content from your money site as syndication to a two-tier network, and that was it, then the persona rings were clearly for manipulation purposes. It's fine to republish your own content to a branded ring because it's your own content and you're already citing the source, right? Which is because it's your content. So that's fine. But what about the tier, the persona networks at tier two? Like it's unnatural for a person in the wild to only share content from one source and that's it. Like that's clearly uh, for using, being used for manipulating search results. And so that's a footprint. That is not a good footprint. That's a bad footprint, right? That's not an entity footprint. If it was, those would all be branded rings. That is a per, that that is a footprint. Again, we talked about persona networks at tier three as opposed to branded. Branded is tier one, or I said tier three. I meant tier two. Branded ring is tier one. Persona rings are tier two. In the um, <clears throat> in which you were asking, right? And so branded um, branded properties is fine. It's fine to do that. You want to expand your footprint, but non branded properties you don't want a footprint. And that having a two-tiered network for syndication of money site content is a is a it leaves a footprint at tier two, unless and even and what I was saying was even at tier two if you if you splice in or add additional triggers from other RSS feeds that are, are related topically relevant content, that's how you can start to populate the other the persona rings syndication networks with other content from other sources still should be topically relevant but that therefore you're you're not you're still not eliminating your footprint but you're significantly reducing it because now your content your original content from your money site is among a lot of other posts on the persona networks it's it's in the midst or among a lot of other content that is also related in the same topical categories but it's from other sources does that make sense which would be a lot more natural because somebody that's interested in a particular topic is going to find content in that topic from various sources. It's not usually going to be just from one source. So you just got to think about it logically, guys. That's the whole point. So I didn't like to use two-tiered networks on money site stuff because it becomes a bitch, a, a pain in the ass to ma manage. Um, remember, you don't have control over other people's RSS feeds. So sometimes, and I've, I've seen this happen, where if you're using other people's RSS feeds to populate persona networks with content from other sources, Sometimes something will happen with their RSS feed and all of a sudden your syndication network gets hits with like 50 posts in one day because something funky happened with their RSS feed and you have no control over it and it triggered syndication over and over and over again. Sometimes duplicate posts over and over and over and over again. Next thing you know, your syndication network properties are terminated or suspended for spam. And it wasn't your fault. It was an RSS feed that was somebody else's feed that you were using to populate. Content. That's why I said, I just, I didn't like to do it. I said, YouTube networks, I'll do it all day long. Uh, multiple tiered networks, but for money site stuff, I like to stick with just a branded network and then just power up that branded network, right? That's the way that I've done it for years. It's a really good question. Next one. Hey guys, I've been in local SEO for a while, but wanting to get some larger link building projects on board. How would you go from doing local SEO campaigns for a couple of hundred a month to getting to a point of two to 3000 per month for ongoing link building and move on to the next level? Um, I mean, I'm not sure I understand. Are you just doing link building or are you doing local SEO, like full on local SEO? Because there's a big difference. Link building is just off page, but like, you know, a, a, a full SEO plan is on page, it's content, it's links, it's all, all of the above, right? Um, so it, like, I'm just not sure I understand what it is that you're doing because you say you want larger link building projects on board. But I don't, are you just, are you doing local SEO or are you just doing link building or what? And I'm not hundred percent sure. So um, there's a few ways that you can increase revenue, right? If you're, if all you're doing is link building, start doing more holistic approach to, to, to SEO, start offering content services, uh, on-page optimization, building branded assets, right? So supporting assets, um, press releases, um, reputation reviews, right? Reputation building, um, you could do reputation marketing, which is, a, you know, David Sprague kind of coined that term. But once, you know, you can help people to build their reputation, but then you can also market their reputation, which again, press releases are great for that. You can do YouTube stuff. Um, you can do ads, right? I, I know we're talking about SEO, but I use ads for SEO as well, right? I use ads to generate leads, but I also, and also for branding campaigns, but I also use ads for SEO because 
traffic from Google ads is our, it's traffic. It's an engagement signal. You're purchasing engagement signals directly from Google. So there's like a number of things that you can do to broaden your kind of service menu, right? Um, then you can start to charge higher prices because you're providing more services. So that's number one. Uh, another way you could do it is if you're only focusing on one service, which makes sense. I've talked about before focusing in on one service and getting really, really good at that until you've monetized it and automa um, either automated or systematized it and then delegate. So if you, if you automate it, you don't need to delegate it. But if you if you need personnel, if humans need to be involved, then you systematize it and delegate it. So what I'm saying is if you want to focus in on one service, which I recommend until you get really good at that and then figure out a way to automate it or systematize and delegate so that you don't have to do it anymore. And then you can focus on the next service. But if you understand all of these things, if you're already proficient in a lot of various, which most of us are, right? Most of us in the SEO business are really good at a lot of different things, right? SEO, content, um, you know, ads, uh, all kinds of stuff. So if, you, if you're good at other things, then you can offer more than just one service, which seems like link building from your question, but I don't know that I'm, I don't know that that's what you meant. Another thing you could do is go with larger clients. Um, so bigger, you know, companies that are a bit bigger. Personally, I'm in a tree service um, industry for my agency. And that's, I prefer that. My retainers are about 33% um, my month, my average monthly retainer is about 33% less than the average monthly retainer for local SEO agencies or local SEO clients, right? The average is about 1500 a month. Mine is a thousand because I deal with tree service contractors, which are generally, typically like 90-10, right? 90% of the time, the tree service contracting companies that I deal with are small organizations or small operations, usually one crew. Um, they're like mom and pop type organizations. So I deal with lower um, retainer clients. It's 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 There are clients that are willing to pay $3,000 a month, but they're not as, they're few, they're, they're a lot less frequent than those that I can get for $1,000 a month. Does that make sense? So, but what I'm saying is perhaps like if I, if I wanted to, I could start targeting larger organizations. Um, I might want to go out to a different industry at that point, but I could target bigger companies that then charge higher prices that have multiple locations, for example, like multiple Google business profiles. Um, another thing you could do would be to, you know, find an industry that just pays higher. Problem with that is it's usually... The reason they pay higher is because it's more competitive. For example, personal injury attorneys <laughs> or any sort of attorney for that matter, but especially personal injury attorneys. Like it's not uncommon to get five, six, eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a month for SEO for one client. It's not, I'm not kidding. It's not, that's not uncommon at all, but it takes so much of that budget to get them results because it's so competitive, you know, and it's, 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 it, to me, I, you know, I prefer making it up. I like, I like tree service industry. It's not uber competitive. Um, I deal with low kind of lower retainer, uh, monthly retainers than the average, but I can make it up in volume. And also I do lead gen, right? So I sell leads and, and that kind of stuff. So, um, but yeah, I mean, there's a number of things you can do. You can scale services. Uh, so ad services, you can go with bigger clients. You can go with clients that have multiple locations as opposed to one location, number of things you can do. It sounds like you'd be a good um, candidate for our mastermind as well. How would you approach SEO for reputation management for a mid-sized company with bad articles on page one and Google news from about six strong local news sites? Um, yeah, I mean, you just got to overpower it by finding, uh, you know, publishing a lot of good press, um, reputation marketing. That's again, David Sprague kind of coined that term, but um, press releases are great for that. YouTube videos. Uh, there's a number of, you know, like web 2.0 properties and stuff that you could optimize. Uh, Google sites are good for that as well, but you could optimize and then just hammer with backlinks to help, um, rank those on page one. Reddit also good. If you can get into Reddit and, and publish something on Reddit, Reddit will rank if, uh, like, you know, um, if you, you can, cause you can hammer like a Reddit post or whatever with, I don't do a lot of Reddit stuff, but I know that they rank. So you could do that. I mean, there's a number of things that you could do. Just if you just go to YouTube and do searching on reputation management, um, you'll find, I don't do that. I don't, I mean, I've done it in the past, but it's not something I typically do. So, uh, but I would, you know, like I said, you can go to YouTube and just find rep, reputation management strategies or methods. Just search that and just start going through. You'll find just from watching a few YouTube videos, you'll find those properties that 
people use to that because they rank fairly easily uh, because they're on high authority properties that you can publish something on and then you focus on link building and, and traffic signals to those properties to get them to rank, which will push those other ones off page, right? Or on the page too. So it's about ranking assets to push the, the, the negative news or negative press off page one. So it requires some, you know, kind of heavy, heavy, um, you have to be really aggressive with link building and stuff, but that's why it's best to try to publish something on or publish on sites or properties that already have a lot of authority because then you can just hammer them. All right, guys, I know we're almost out of time or we are out of time. I'm going to try to roll through just a couple more real fast. If anybody has to go, just go. I'll handle it. Um, hey, guys, I have a website hosted on a platform that wrote blog posts, et cetera, while host that wrote blog posts, et cetera, while hosted there. I want to move the domain to my own hosting, but they say I can't take the blog post with me. My question is, should I gather up all the URLs of the blog posts that are on the platform and try a bulk 301 redirect or simply cut and run? If yes, any recommendations on what to use for bulk redirect them all? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, you know, I, I'm just not sure I understand. If if you're trying to do redirects away from, I, see, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, I want to move the domain to my own hosting. They say you can't take the... Well, you can always rebuild the blog post. Like, for example, if you have WordPress, so you have like, uh, I don't know, like PHP or something like that, you can rebuild the URL structure and literally copy paste the text and images, et cetera, from the blog posts on the old platform and move them uh, to your new platform and pretty much recreate them there. So that's definitely an easy strategy to how to move those. Yeah, I mean, and yeah, I mean, like you could extract the content a number of ways just copy and paste from where it's currently published but that's the the point is like are you running are you going to run the risk of some sort of legal action like do they own the content you know like i, I there's a lot of there's gotcha. a lot of unanswered questions here um i don't want to give you any recommendations on this because i don't have full context so mm. um and you could run into legal issues if you're trying to take the content that they legally own and you're republishing it like i don't i see i don't know i don't know what the nuance of that situation is i'm sorry i can't give you a better answer i just need more context really is the gmb checklist you recommend putting the gmb site url in the website field where or how is the company website url entered well you can you don't have to though um that's changed a bit and you know it's it's been updated in the mastermind but the uh you can do that but it because remember the, there's an appointment url field in most google business profiles so you can make the main website it, this is what i taught and for a long time, that is what I did was I would use the Google business website as the primary website URL in the Google profile, right? And then I would make the appointment URL, the money site URL, if that's available. But you can you can do it the other way around, which and a lot of, and I did that for my own lead gen assets because I owned them and I didn't like, I knew that that was good for SEO and I didn't care because most, you know, most of the uh, tree, most tree service stuff, people just go to Google maps and they call, like I said, not like this is not a joke out of 50 leads that we get we might have two that are from form fills 48 of them are going to be phone calls and so i didn't care people don't really in all i'm trying to say is for my own lead gen stuff and i would i, I taught this in the in the sops and everything else said look if you got a client and the client wants their main website url like as the uh, website associated with the google business profile it makes sense they don't want the one page free website as their main website from the Google business profile. I get that. They, that's what they want. That's what you do. So you can still get that make appointment that, that do follow link from the Google business website by using the make appointment button at the top of the site and then linking to the money site, right? The reason why I liked using the Google business website as the primary website URL in the Google maps listing was because if you do CTR traffic or CTR manipulation, then you would every time they would uh, click the website URL button, it would be another engagement signal on a Google profile because it would click the map, uh, it would visit the map, the Google Business Profile map, right? Then click the website button, which would register as a, a, a traffic, a visitor on the Google Business website, which is a powerful signal. That's why I did it, but it's not necessary because you can still get the benefit of the Google Business, um, the do follow link from the Google Business website by using the make appointment button at the top the CTA button at the top of the website, if that makes sense. So you can use the, ma the main money site URL as the website URL for the Google business profile. 
right? But if you were, if you were going to use the Google business website as the main website URL, then you enter the company website URL as the appointment URL. Okay. And in, in the uh, Google business manager dashboard, so business.google.com, which Google's trying to take that away from us now and forcing us to use the profile manager in the SERPs or in maps, but in the kind of older business dashboard, which is still available, at least on accounts where it was available. I don't know about brand new accounts, but um, if you had access to the Google business dashboard, you still do. At least every account that I do still does. Um, but you, in the info tab, you will most Google business profiles will have an, inf, uh, an appointment URL field. And that's where you would put your money site URL. One more thing on the previous question, Mr. 301 redirects. So like mm -hmm. 301 redirect in bulk, the easiest way is to use HD access or a yes. PHP script and just move that forward. Yeah, and if you were doing WordPress stuff, there's some bulk redirect plugins that you can use, yep. um, which would like CSV upload, tar uh, originating URL in column one, um, new URL in column two. And you just upload a CSV file and all the redirects are done. And all they do is add them to the HD access file. All right, last two, and I know we're over, sorry guys. Timid person, does syn content syndication like Syndication Academy still work with the latest Google helpful content update? Yeah, because I mean, as I just mentioned guys, you're sharing your own content, right? That's why it, it has always worked and will continue to work. Um, as long as you're producing decent content, the helpful content update doesn't affect sharing content. Like that's not what it was intended for. It was like, if you're just producing content for the sake of producing content and it's not helpful, that's what that's supposed to be combating. And why? It's because of all the AI content generators. Like seriously, that's the whole reason that Google started this helpful content update is because of they're trying to, it, that the, if you can imagine because of AI writing assistance, the sheer volume, the explosion of content over the last year since the AI writing assistance have really taken off and Google's servers are way overloaded. They're having trouble keeping up with indexing. Why do you think indexing has been an issue for the last several months, guys? It's because Google's having a hell of a, a hell of a time trying to keep up in indexing and indexing and crawling. Think of the server resources it requires. When, it, when we were all producing content manually, like it was much easier on Google. Now that there's AI writing assistance, people are publishing thousand article sites in a matter of a month with a thousand posts on it because of AI writing assistance, like, you know, there are a dime a dozen. And so that's what the helpful content update was about, is, is about combating that, not syndicating your content. That's content amplification, right? That's what content syndication is. It's amplifying your content. And across branded profiles, that's perfectly reasonable. In fact, it's expected. So what do you recommend just branding and linking the profiles? Um, well, well, like I said, guys, we don't do a lot of syndication only because IFTTT changed their structure. Um, and now, you know, it's, it's not so much about content syndication. You still can, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I just, I don't really focus on the syndicating part of much anymore. It's about expanding the entity footprint, right? Creating new profiles on other platforms and then interlinking when possible. Um, I think what you said here, Linking the profiles, yes. And then instead of syndicating, just post three to four articles on the properties. Yeah, you can do that as well. And that actually, there's something to be said for that. You know, publish original content on each one of the different platforms, right? And then then those become really good link building targets too, because you can build tier two links very aggressively to those branded posts or those posts that are on branded profiles that are unique instead of syndicating. It does provide more SEO value that way. Last one is great insight from the CID URL for schema. Do you talk more about this in the mastermind too? Of course, mastermind, I'm an open book. There is nothing that I hide in the mastermind. And that is the truth. Just ask anybody in the mastermind. And whoever brave one is says that I killed it today. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. Appreciate the compliment. Anyways, thanks everybody for sticking around. That was 10 minutes longer than it should have been. Oh no. Cheers. <laughs> thanks guys. Bye everyone.